So, who likes forms? <laughs> Two people. I don't like forms. I, uh, I've been doing Angular since it was in uh, beta phase, and I've been struggling with forms my entire Angular career, even with AngularJS, struggled with it. So in the beginning, we had these template-driven forms, and then they gave us React forms, and struggled with those as well. Struggled with them my entire career, especially when creating huge forms, um, having value changes on value changes, combining streams, again, empowering the form, and so on. Been struggling with it. So today we're going to talk about forms. So my name is Brecht Billet. I'm the founder of Simplified Courses. I have a blog. I do some YouTube. I do online courses, consultancy, and some general architecture. So one slide about me. That's it. Um, before I continue, I want to give some credits to two people. One of them is Ward Bell, who gave very awesome talks at NGConf 2021 and 2022, and they inspired me a lot on how I do forms today. So there's also a practical guide of Tim de Schrever, who um, wrote a blog article, a very complete blog article about Angular template-driven forms. So this is what we're going to tackle today. Just want to show you one slide of how we're going to tackle template-driven forms. So at the, at the left side, you can see it's quite declarative. We will create a view model. I will explain everything later. Um, but this is basically a rather complex form that, um, that has been covered in a few lines of code. Uh, by the way, is the noise good for everyone? Because I have this buzzing sound going on here. Nobody hears it? Too loud? OK, can someone from the technical? OK. <clears throat> so overview of today, first of all, we're going to talk about signals, which is a new reactive primitive in the Angular ecosystem. Then we're going to talk about view models. And view models are basically reactive models specifically tailored for the template. So we can embark on better reactivity, declarative code. And it also creates some form of encapsulation between the template and the actual class. Then we're going to tackle reactive forms and template-driven forms. So first, we're going to tackle what reactive forms are all about, and then what the difference is between template-driven forms. And since we have signals, we can now create unidirectional template-driven forms with only a few lines of code. So we're going to dive deeper into that. Then we're going to tackle declarative view models, and we're going to compare the code we have to write with reactive forms with template-driven forms. And then we're going to tackle model validations, which is something I'm a huge fan about. It's about separating a very annoying concept called validation completely from Angular. So we could reuse it in the back end. We can reuse it in different parts of a monorepo, maybe. Um, so we're going to use Vest for that. And then I'm going to show you a demo. So what are signals? Signals are a reactive primitive in Angular. It's there right now. You can use it. It's not in developer preview anymore, except of the effect. It's glitch-free, and it's perfect for state management. So before in Angular, we had RxJS. Are there RxJS fans in the room? That's nice. I'm also an RxJS fan, but I also hate RxJS because if I've written some RxJS code like six months ago, it's hard to understand. Or if a colleague has written it, it's a very nice uh, technology, but it can make things very complex. So to show the difference between RxJS and signals, so in RxJS, we have this thing called a behavior subject, which is basically an observable as a subject that has a value, that has an initial value. And you can see that count A equals signal 0 is the equivalent. It's way easier. It's just a function that holds a value. In 
In RxJS, we had this operator called map, where we could map a specific value towards another value, like double A is the double value of count A. So every time count A changes, double A changes as well. With signals, we don't have map, we don't have combined latest, but we have this computed function, which is completely memoized and will take a signal, do some kind of calculation on it and return a new signal. So how can we consume a signal? A signal is just a simple function, so we just have to execute it. When we execute a signal, we get back the value. There are two ways of updating a signal. We have a set function, so we can just set it a new value. And in the first example, you can see that we read the initial value, we increment it by one, and we set count A as a signal. We also have a more convenient uh, function, which is called update, with, which gives back the current value as the first argument. Let me quickly... <clears throat> All right, view models. So what are view models? View models are reactive objects and they're specifically tailored for a template. It could be an observable or a signal. For this session today, we're only going to talk about signals since Angular is more embracing signals than observables. We can still use observables, but maybe we shouldn't constantly use them to do state management and so on. The goal of view models is to avoid complex template logic, but also to avoid redundancy. And here I want to show you an example of a pager. And this is a real abomination. Like this is, this is code that, I, that I'm, I'm not happy about. So what's wrong with this code? So first of all, we have a huge amount of logic inside of our template. We even had to expose like the moth um, class to the template so we can calculate the pager. We have redundancy in there and we even have redundant complex logic. So it's not that complex, but still this is not the stuff that you want to have inside of your template. So let's create three state signals for our uh, specific pager. So we have the total page index and items per page. Both or the three of them having an initial value of zero. Then we can compute the view model. And this makes a lot of sense because we have access to our signals. The signals are completely reactive. So we can calculate our view model in one place inside of our class and then use it in the template. So we have just moved all the dirty template logic inside of our class. We can still like split it up and everything. It's easier to test. It's readable and it's completely declarative. So this is what a template now looks like. We just access the VM, which is the view model, and we have a complete, nice and clean template. So reactive forms. So who that is here available um, is using reactive forms? Most of you and the other people uh, are not waking up. I'm pretty sure 90% is using reactive forms because you know that's what the Angular um, community tells us to use. Like they had template-driven forms initially, and then they gave us reactive forms. So why would you use template-driven forms, right? So it's been, it's been seen as a standard by many, like the, the template-driven forms, but we manually have to create them. We don't have an automatic way of creating these forms. We have to use the form builder API, and you have like control and form groups. And you have this big block of code that you have to write, and you have to manually add validators and stuff like that. And you can extract observables from them which is awesome, right? Because if something changes in your form, you might want to react on that. You, you might want to maybe load some additional data or disable a form control or even a form group or remove a form control or a form group or even set a different 
part in your form. You want to update a different part in your form because something changed. So this is what it looks like. So we're bu building a form with uh, form group, form controls, and then we can add validators. I suppose for people doing Angular, especially reactive forms, this kind of looks familiar, right? And then in the template, we have form group and form control, and then you can link it all together. So you have this form.controls.password.control.password, and you could also use form control name, but then it's harder to combine it with like subcomponents and stuff like that. So this is basically what reactive forms are all about. And we can listen to changes, which is awesome, right? Like we have the form controls age, and when the person is of legal age, then we don't want to uh, enter the emergency contact number, but when the person is underaged, then we want to enable it. So here we have some imperative enabling and disabling to, um, yeah, to react when the age changes. Let's say that we have a gender, which could be male, female, or other. And when you click on other, the radio button, you get an additional field where you want to say what kind of gen uh, gender you have. Um, again, here, we subscribe to the value changes, which gives an observable back. And when the gender is other, we add a control. Otherwise, we remove the control because we don't want to keep that other field inside of the state of our form. Let's say that we have addresses, like we have a shipping address, uh, we have a billing address, and we have a checkbox like the shipping address is different than the billing address. Then we need to add an entire new block, like an extra address there, uh, or we can enable or disable it. Again, conditionally enabling, disabling, it's imperative code. And when your form gets huge, like when you, when you have like this huge form, it's filled with these value changes, with subscribes, and then you have to make sure that you do like take until, take until destroy, you have to combine stuff, you have to reset stuff, and so on, and it can get kind of painful. So another problem that we have is like the validations just return like an object with key, with key value. So like required true makes sense. You could have like one generic message says, this is required. But like when it's max length or when it's a valid phone, like you have to constantly map these errors. So that's, that's an issue that we have. We have some imperative code like I've shown you before and a lot of manual work. We also have boilerplates and huge forms. They tend to get complex over time. So let's dive into the basic version of template-driven forms. <clears throat> so template-driven forms, they have less boilerplate, and the template actually defines the form. So there are form controls and form groups behind the scenes, and Angular does all the work for us. And this is very key. When you're creating your template and you're, you're adding the right directives, Angular will create an entire form group with form controls and so on for you. So how do we create a template-driven form? You just have to import the forms module. This creates an ng form. So this is the only thing that you need to do. It will look for that form selector and it will create an ng form behind the scenes. That's the only thing that we need to do. And when we want to have access to the ng form, we can use this template variable, have access to the directive, and use a view child to get access to our ng form. And the cool thing is, and we probably know this, or maybe not, this actually creates the same as a reactive form behind the scenes. This also has a form group and form controls and value changes and everything that you love about reactive forms. But Angular creates this for us. The only thing that we have here is this form value. And this form value is just an object that will, be get, that will get updated by the form automatically. Angular is doing all the heavy lifting for us. 
So how does it work? It works with banana in the box, two-way data binding. I don't like two-way data binding, by the way. We're going to fix that later, but like in general, Angular will update the form value for us, and it will create a reactive form, or not a reactive form, but a form group, which is the same with form controls behind the scenes. But again, there's not that much boilerplate going on. The only thing that we have is like the engine model and the name. And the name is the key that will be added into the ng form. So that is that. Let's dive a little bit deeper. So we had the controls. Let's go to the control groups. So ng model group would create a form group for us behind the scenes. And here we have another ng model. So for the password and the confirmed password. So that's basically template driven forms in a nutshell. So instead of using the uh, the control and the control group, we use ng model and ng model group with name. So there's not that much boilerplate going on, but Angular will create like the equivalent of reactive form behind the scenes. So this is what actually being created. So we have an ng form, and then there we see that form is a form group, and there are controls in there, and there are also form groups in there. Like this is completely created by Angular for us because we have just put it in the template. And you have to put it in the template anyway, even with reactive forms. And you can see it also has the value changes. So every control, every form group that we have in there, it has value changes. So if you look at this, there is not a single um, difference between reactive forms and template-driven forms when it comes to form groups and form controls. All right. So this is a reactive form. You can see that we have form control, form group, this is a reactive approach, and we have to use the form builder API to create first name, password, password, confirm password, and so on. It's cool, that's nice, it's a simple form, but it will get more annoying when we have to conditionally add and remove controls, when we have to conditionally enable and disable controls or groups. So let's look at the template-driven form equivalent. So we can see that we have the ng model group and the name. So we also have some code in there. We always have some code. We can add some validators in there, which is also something I'm not a fan of, having these validators in our template because they get shattered everywhere. They're not reusable, <coughs> and so on. And the only thing that we need to do in the template-driven form and the class is provide a form value. So there's no boilerplate going on there. There are some downsides. Like the validators are shattered all over the place and you have to create a directive for every validator. And it's basically like validations is an issue with forms. It's not typo safe. So that means that when you mistype something, in the name attributes, like first name is first name, for instance, then you're not going to have a runtime error. It's just going to break. The rest is completely type safe, but that name attribute is not type safe. I've written an article about that on how to make it type safe. So it's definitely possible to do that so that you get like runtime errors when you mistype something there. It's not part of this talk, but it's possible. And what is interesting to realize about template-driven forms is these forms are created over time. So what happens is like the template gets evaluated, right? We have an input first name, so we add that first name to the ng form. Then we have another input for, uh, last name, we also add that to the ng form. So that means that your form is always partial. Even, even worse, it's deep partial. So if you have like form groups, like every control, everything in your form is like deep partial. And you have to treat your form like that as well. And it makes sense because Angular does the heavy lifting. Angular is creating your form. There's also the performance cost that comes with that because it will run change detection twice. But in my experience, it's a trivial cost. The upside is, like I said before, Angular is doing all the heavy lifting, declarative code, and we still have the reactive controls and groups that we're all so fond about. 
we will fix the validations and the not in the next one but after that chapter and the typo issues like i said before i can share the article but let's first dive into unidirectional template driven forms with signals so right now we just used an object to keep the state of that form we're going to refactor that to use a signal and this is really awesome because that makes unidirectional data flow possible so we will ditch that banana in the box syntax. We will ditch that two-way data binding. So ng model will not have like uh, the, the banana in the box syntax anymore. We will use a view model to make it more declarative. And this is what it looks like. So you can see this is way cleaner than before. There's no two-way data binding going on anymore. So the data will flow from the signal into the ng model. And then later on, we will listen to the form and write it back to the signal. So we have this unidirectional flow going on. Again, there's not that much boilerplate in my, uh, in my template. All right. So with the view child, we can have access to the ng form. We have the form value, which is now a signal of purchase form model. This is my form model. It's completely typed. Again, deep partial. We also can keep track of the dirty state or maybe when it's valid or not. And in the ng after view in it, we can have access to the ng form, listen to the value changes and set the form value again. So the view model exposes the form value. It will go into the template. In the template, it will feed the ng model, which is one-way data binding. And when something changes, we will get called into this observable from the form, we subscribe in it and we reset our signal, ensuring a unidirectional data flow. There's still too much boilerplate going on. So how can we even make this cleaner? Like I don't want to implement ng after view in it all the time. I don't want to work with template variables to get access to my form. I want like a clean solution. The whole point of, of optimizing forms for me was that I struggled with it, like a lot of boilerplate, a lot of complexity. So let's create this form directive. And this form directive will just hook into the selector form. Like we already have that. We just want to hook into that. And now we have access to ng form. And ng form is just the instance of our entire form. The only thing left to do is listen to value changes and expose the form value and whether it's dirty. So we have two outputs. So again, we have one directive for the selector form. We have access to the ng form and we expose two outputs, making sure that we can ditch like a lot of boilerplate code. So this is what it looks like now. We have a form with a form value change, form dirty change, and our class looks like this. We have a signal with a form value and we have form dirty. So in the first part, you can see that we just set these signals directly. So this is the only code needed to create a unidirectional form, which is almost nothing. And we can ditch the ng after view in it completely. Like, we would never be able to create a reactive form with the amount of code that we have here. I still haven't talked about the template that much, but we'll cover that later. And now for me, this becomes really awesome because everyone is in love with reactive programming and declarative programming, and still we are constantly manually subscribing and doing imperative logic. Here we're going to leverage those few models that we saw before to create a clean template and to make sure that everything is still reactive without a boilerplate. So let me have one sip first. I love it that there's a table here. So no more imperative coding. Imperative coding is awesome, but it has its place. When the data flows from top to bottom, we want to think reactive. When we want to notify something upstairs, we probably want to do some imperative uh, coding. So, no more manual subscriptions on value changes. No more manual enabling or disabling or adding 
or removing or adding validators or removing validators. We don't want to do that anymore. So, still on time. Okay. Um, we want to do conditional enabling and disabling. This is the imperative stuff. This is the reactive part. We all know that, right? Like we subscribe to this observable and we have to do stuff in our form. This is the declarative part. This is what we, what we calculate in our view model. This is a one-liner. This is way cleaner and it's still reactive and it's still declarative. And we have a clean template. We don't have any conditionals in our template. We just have like disabled VM dot emergency contact disabled. The same goes for adding and removing. So the same for the gender. We had to add a control, remove a control. And afterwards, in the template, we still had to do an ng if, because otherwise we would get an error and we do not like errors and we don't want to write that much code. So we have a one liner again. Show other gender is a calculation and the view model starts to become very readable. Like, okay, my emergency contact is disabled when this happens. We have to show the other gender when that happens. And again, we bind it to our view model, clean template. So showed it before as one of the first slides, but this is the declarative stuff going on. So we expose the four model, whether the emergency contact is disabled, when we want to show the other gender and show the shipping address. So model validations. We have covered a lot on template driven forms, but form validations are hard. Like who has never struggled with validations? Nobody's raising their hands. Awesome. We want to have conditional validators. We want to have a decent message. We don't want to have like boilerplate going on and we don't want to be tied to the framework because maybe in our monorepo we have Angular, but also React or Quick or whatever. And we want to reuse those, reuse those validations. Or if you have an OGS backend, you want to reuse those as well. And custom validators, they're just a lot of work when it comes to template-driven forms. So let's say our purchase form model, like these are required, the gender order is required, but only when the gender is set to other. Otherwise, we don't want to execute that validation. Age, emergency contact number is only required when the person is not of legal age. Then we have like the composability, like the billing address, it has address validations. We want to reuse that and the shipping address also has address validations, but it should only be executed when the shipping address is different than the billing address. Moving further to the address form model, these are just required and the passwords are also required, but the confirm is only required when the password is required and they also has to be the same. So a lot of conditionals, reusability, composability inside of these validations. So what are model validations? We're not validating a form anymore. We're validating a model. And we don't care about Angular or any other technology that we're using. We just want to validate a model. And for that, we're going to write suites. And for that, we're going to use VEST. So we have the ng validators from Angular, and these will execute parts of those suites for us. No more boilerplate. So the model validation suites are readable, they're reusable, they're composable, they're testable, and you can do conditional validations. They're also centered in one place, completely cut off from the framework that we're using. So what is VEST? <coughs> VEST is a declarative um, validations framework. It's very awesome. It's framework uh, agnostic, and it looks like writing unit tests. It's very lightweight. And this is what it looks like. So we're creating a new suite with the static suite function. And you can see that we get access to the entire form model, which is awesome because if we want to do a validation, sometimes we need parts of our form model to do that validation. We have custom messages. We don't have like the object that was returned before. We have clean messages that we can create and an easy and readable syntax. like. Enforce model at last name is not blank. That means that last name is required. It's a simple validation, but you get the gist. So the anatomy, like we have an input name equals last name, like this field last name refers to that. 
Here we have an ng model group passwords, and in there we have a password. So Angular have created a form group for us with passwords, and that they have cre it has created a um, form control password. So passwords that password is the field that is going to validate. Sometimes we want to do validation on controls, but sometimes we also want to do validations on the group. So there we can use passwords. So password that confirm password equals password that password. That makes sense. But we also want conditional validations, like the emergency contact number. This is fairly easy to read, right? It's like we omit all the tests inside of this function when the age is over 18 years old. That's readable, that's understandable. I love the syntax. We want validations on groups, so we want to validate not passwords, not password, but passwords, because we also want validations on the groups, not just on the controls. So model passwords that confirm passwords equals model passwords that password makes sense. We also want to reuse it, like I mentioned before, the address. Again, this is just a simple function, reusable wherever you want to reuse it. So we create a child suite, and inside of our purchase validations, we use it for the billing address. But we also want to use it for the shipping address. So we have just reused the validations, but they can only be executed when the shipping address is different than the billing address. Validations can become very complex over time, and having them separate is really relieving. I've been using this approach for about six months, maybe longer, and it made the code base way, way cleaner. You can just like test your validations completely separately, and you have access to the entire model, you have conditional stuff, you have reusable stuff, you can validate multiple form groups. I wouldn't use JSON stringify for that, but you know, you get the idea. So I open sourced my, uh, my form solution, and I want to show you a demo. This is really awesome, by the way. So this is uh, an API, swappy.dev. I use it all the time. It's a Star Wars API, just a REST API, and it's always available, except today. So I will be able to do my demo, but not everything. So I created this form. So this is open, this is open source. It has like a complex form in there. Um, you can, it's a stack blitz. You can reuse it. It also has a starter. Um, so it has to show validations on Blur. Yay, that works. I'm not going to submit because then my demo is ruined and I'm afraid to refresh. So let's just say if I type Brecht in here, then the gender is set to male. If I type my last name, it sets my passwords because that makes sense in a form, right? Um, when I type Luke, my demo will fail because the API is down. But you can do some stuff like, okay, when the, where is it? Like right now, emergency contact is required. It's not required anymore. So that kind of stuff. We have these passwords like this is not required. Uh, it is required because password is filled in. If it's not filled in, it's not required anymore. So tests test. So now they don't match. So we also have validations on the group. All right. There are some other stuff in there. Like you can see here, the addresses, the shipping address is not part of my model here. But when I click this button, then it's still empty because nothing is filled in. But Angular is creating those controls for us. So when we click this, Angular will remove the form group for us, will remove the validations and all that other stuff. So we're really letting Angular do some heavy lifting here. So definitely uh, play around with that if you, if you have time. And further, let's go back to slideshow. I have created this 
open source thing where we want to remove even more boilerplate. So the only thing that we need to do is expose the suite to our form, import template-driven forms. It has like four components, three components and two directives, something like that. They're very, very small. The code is also quite understandable. And this is the only thing that we need to do. And validations just work completely. We pass the model, we pass the suite, and we use this SE input wrapper thing, which does content projection, and will show the validation error. So, sorry, this is the only code that we need to write for creating a template-driven form which has declarative view models. We can enable, disable stuff in a very readable way and validations automatically work. So it will take that fast suite and it will just pass it to that form and we don't have to write validations ever again the way we used to do it. So we just, this is an example of the form directive where we pass the model and the suite. And here we're going to hook into the ng model. This is part of the template driven forms uh, thing. So we don't have to write that ourselves. But behind the scenes, it's an asynchronous validator. And that asynchronous validator has access to this form directive, which has the model and the suite. And the validate function will pass that to our vest suite, returning the errors. And the whole thing is done. So again, no boilerplate whatsoever, because we hook into this um, ng model selector. The same goes for ng model group. So it also implements the async validator function. So Angular knows it's a validator and it will just give the, the model and the suite to vest returning the errors and everything is done. So what is important to realize is that this approach is totally Angular friendly. We are still using Angular validators. We are still, uh, you have like the, the valid state, you have the touch state, you have like the pending state, you have all that Angular stuff. The only difference is this validate function uses the vest suite behind the scenes and it will update the Angular validators automatically. So if you're going to use like um, update value and validity or other stuff, it's still going to work. It's still like Angular validators the way you're used to do it. But inside of this validate function, we're going to the vest suite so we can decouple the actual validations completely from all the rest. But it's the same as the one before. So the SC input wrapper, it works for inputs, but it also works for groups. So we saw for the passwords, like the password is required, but also the message says password and confirm password should be the same. So then we would have a validation on passwords. So again, we just use the SE input wrapper, no boilerplate at all. This is what the SE input wrapper looks like. So you can see it does content projection. And for the rest, it just shows a diff with the errors. And where do the errors live? Do they live in VEST? No, they live on our form controls and form groups because we are still using validations the Angular way. We just don't write bullet plate anymore. All right. So the complete solution is in the demo that I already shown. If you like this talk, you can follow me on Twitter. And I also have a um, template-driven forms course for the people that are interested. Um, with this code, you can get a 20% discount. I am actually rewriting uh, the course because there's a lot of new changes in Angular. But so the price will, will, will change. But the price today, and uh, the people that have bought the course get like the free update. So that's it. Uh, I don't know if I'm still in time because we started a bit uh, later. So if there's time for some Q&A, yeah. OK, we have five minutes to do some Q&A. Yes? I'm sorry, you, you're saying that if you, if, why would you use template driven forms or? Reactive, reactive forms. You can still use reactive forms, but. 
What? I, I don't use reactive forms anymore. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. The question was, why would you still use reactive forms? So it's, it's, it's a big discussion, right? So I don't want to sound too biased because I've been using a lot of template-driven forms lately. But so I, I'm a front-end architect at DHL. And we all use template-driven forms there now. And it made us way more productive because we have the declarative part. You could also use like model validations with reactive forms, I think. Um, but we're doing way less heavy lifting than uh, we did before. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, like, passwords do not match. Is this, is this like the message you want to show in the, in the form, like the error message? This is exactly the error message. And the question was, like, how do you do this with your translation uh, framework? So depending on which translation framework you use, like you have like the, the, the Angular translations, localization, that is like part of the compile step, I think, that it changes stuff, then the, the thing that replaces it would have to do it on compile time, but you could also pass like a function, a model. So if you create a, let me go here, like you could create a factory function for this. And in that factory function, you can provide a service. If you have like a service that translates, you can just provide it in here. So then that factory function would get the translation service, um, yeah, it would return the actual suite, but you could translate it here then, based on the translation service. Yes? Okay, so the question is, um, a lot of um, translation frameworks are still observable based. So how does that work? That's actually a very interesting question because I don't know if you saw it or not, but I'm not using ng validators, I'm using ng async validators. So this approach, and I would show that in my demo, but um, it didn't work. You can also do asynchronous validations. So the moment that you can do asynchronous validations, then you could also um, use observables there and use the signal or just subscribe it or, or create a, a promise for that. So at my blog, Simplified Courses, I, uh, I have written a lot of articles about this approach and asynchronous validation is also a part of that. And we cannot know in VEST whether a test is asynchronous or not. So for that reason, also other performance reasons, everything is asynchronous. So everything is an, is an asynchronous validator, so you can just hook in there if you, uh, if you want. Yeah, time is over. Thank you.